Hello everyone! Today we are going to do another fascinating topic. We are going to cover population changes. You might have heard a lot in the news recently about uh, population crisis. Some people call it that way. Some big employers and very rich people are worried that they won't be able to find enough workforce in the future or there won't be so much competition so they have to pay people actual living wages and <laughs> salaries are going to rise you know how the news are driven a lot of it is really about those who have money anyway it's an important thing for all of us so let's have a quick look at what's going on with it um so a little history first what do you think how big was the population of the earth in 1000 in 1500 and 1900 take a quick second think about it make a guess um, and you might also want to think about Japan's population today Japan's population is 125 million the numbers are globally in 1000 it was about 300 million people the entire planet around 1500 about 500 million and at the turn of the last century 1.6 billion for Japan the numbers are considerably lower 4.5 7 million 8 17 of course these are very rough estimates it's very hard to get this kind of stuff right but what's the world's population today you can check it out live in the link below uh, but it's over 8 billion since uh, I think we passed 8 billion uh, last year so we must be close to 8 billion and uh, maybe 50 million 70 million something like that anyway the world's population is growing very rapidly so why is everyone worried about fertility and replacement rates what are these things well the VHO definition of fertility rate is the average number of children a hypothetical cohort of women would have at the end of their reproductive period if they were subject during their whole lives to the fertility rates of a given period and if they were not subject to mortality it is expressed as children per women what does this mean in simple terms fertility rate is how many children the average woman has in a given country if they live to the average lifespan of women in that country the replacement rate is a little bit different replacement level fertility is the total fertility rate the average number of children born per woman at which a population exactly replaces itself from one generation to the next without migration this rate is roughly 2.1 children per woman for most countries although it may modestly vary with mortality rates so if most women would have two or three children in a country it would mean that uh, the number of the population would stay roughly the same maybe there would be a little bit of growth if there are pandemics or other uh, shocking events like big wars it might go down slightly but there would be no big change now right now how is the global fertility rate changing it's declining and this is very interesting right we see the global population growing very very rapidly but compared to the number of women fewer children are born every year the absolute number of women is of course still growing hence the world population is growing um, that's why in real terms the world population is still growing how is the replacement rate in Japan? Japan is the country most often discussed in this context but actually as you will see the Japanese trend is pretty much the same as in all high income and middle income countries um, but just to you know misspell the myth that this is just about Japan it's about uh, all middle income and, and high income countries but then again Japan is an interesting example in 2022 the replacement rate in Japan was 1.367 so very very low far below the replacement rate required to keep the population number steady which would be 2.1 as we saw so what does this mean is this something that we should be worried about well if you look at the total fertility rate for the entire world you can see that 
in most countries the fertility rate is very similar it's between one and two same is true of Canada the US uh, large parts of Central and South America Brazil Australia Russia most of Europe even some parts of Africa the Arab world uh, in this year India as well is under two India and China has for a while now been under two as you see the countries where the fertility rate is significantly higher there are a couple of countries in South America Central America mostly in Africa and maybe a few in West and Central Asia what unites so why is the population issue important um, you can think about some issues and it's a good exercise I usually ask my students to do that in class now some of the things that people come up with are um, you know finding workers um, if there are not enough people paying taxes and social contributions it's very hard to keep our social institutions schools hospitals road systems energy systems energy grids you be all need clean water electricity and so on it's very hard to keep this kind of things going pensions um, employment unemployment issues right we might not have enough workers in critical sectors or um, people might uh, companies might collapse and then unemployment kicks in um, competition for jobs can be very fierce if the replace if the fertility rate is very high unemployment might be high if it's very low it's rather the other, other way around um, and of course it endangers taxes and public goods uh, if there are not enough people to work in public institutions social institutions libraries schools hospitals nursing homes and so on then a lot of our social fabric unravels and you might think about social uh, unrest rest and peace um, of course the powerful in every society want to extract more and more um, they're only happy until there is large economic growth and there is money that they can distribute between themselves their cronies their families and so on um, the middle class hasn't really gained anything in most developed countries in the last 40 50 years but people have relatively steady stable not too horrible lives in most of these countries um, but it's a big question whether there's going to be enough left right if the rich and greedy the powerful are upset and there isn't much growth they're going to start taking more and more from the middle classes and uh, low-income people so these are all issues and they might lead to exploitation and slavery as well if the pressure becomes too big and of course poverty and inequality can increase as well as a result not to mention migration right people are going to leave countries that are becoming dysfunctional and they are going to go in large masses to countries that are still functional and doing better and of course economic growth it's a very interesting thing we need economic growth for two reasons to keep the violent powerful people satisfied keep them away from the rest of us keep them busy with the economy keep them in competition with each other so that they hurt each other we don't hurt masses of people they don't start wars to get more money uh, or at least only in moderate uh, extent and um, of course for the rest of us as well I mean some amount of the economic growth does seem to uh, improve uh, social systems and quality of life although we don't see much of this in the last decades okay so what's the global composition by age right like there are all these things why this question is important but how do things really stand right now this is global population now, we're not talking about Japan East Asia or developed countries high-income countries 0 to 14 year olds are one quarter of the world 15 to 24 15 percent middle-aged people younger middle-aged people I would say and middle-aged people they're about 50 percent and then 65 and over mature people are about nine and a half nine point seven percent so this was in 2022 probably since then the world became a little bit older so there are a little bit more in these brackets and maybe a little bit less but probably the difference is not huge um, you can calculate based on these numbers the ratio of working people working age people and non-working people right the non-working people obviously need to be supported 
uh, by the working age people. And the working age people are roughly 50%, as we can see. Younger people are typically, at least in high income, middle income countries, studying these days, doing internships, gaining practice, doing their university studies. And most people um, retire around 60, 68, depending on the country you're looking at. Um, so, right, you see that there are about 40, 50% of people who are not in a job, but it's not necessarily a problem. That's pretty normal. I mean, salaries should easily cover the needs of uh, people. That's how most societies are calibrated and how our business systems are set up. Actually, they could probably do more if distribution would be better, but that's a separate question. Um, now, another important thing is who takes care of the young people, especially under 14 people need more caretaking, or under five, especially, right? And over a certain age, if people become infirm or ill, they need a lot of caretaking as well. So how many people are needed to work as a main job or full-time or, you know, in a way that keeps them out of employment uh, to take care of others? Now, don't get me wrong. Caretaking is one of the most productive and high-impact activities. It's enormously important for societies, but it doesn't lead to economic growth necessarily. depends on how you structure it, how you pay for it. Um, so it can pose some economic issues if too many people are in caretaking jobs. Now this relates again to the composition and workforce um, and you can look at it in different countries, US, UK, Germany, Japan, China, this comes from the World Bank, um, how the percentages of young people changed from 2010 and then from 2010 to 2019 uh, it's going down almost everywhere significantly. In Japan, you see the you see a sharp decline, not much different from Germany, um, sharper than in the UK and the US. But these countries have significant immigration. Uh, you see a very sharp, extremely sharp decline in, in China. Um, now, this is the proportion of people who are retired or not working anymore, not necessarily old. Many of them are very healthy, uh, middle-aged, fit people or mature people who are still living life to the fullest. But you can see that their proportion is very steadily increasing in all these societies. And um, the participation of women in the labor force has uh, changed a little bit as well. In the US, interestingly, it went down somewhat. But everywhere else, uh, it's been increasing um, or at least by a, at least a little bit since the 1990s. Um, now this shows you that the lack of younger people is to some extent um, replaced by women entering the workforce, which is not a bad thing necessarily, but traditionally in most societies women used to do caretaking jobs. It's very important for guys to help out more, right? If your wife enters the workforce, she won't be able to uh, take care of kids and others in the same way. It becomes a team game, definitely. Um, besides questions of quality, it's also for just pure rational time management and economic reasons also very important that uh, people do better in splitting family work and caretaking work. Right, so what's the situation outside of Japan? Which country has the lowest fertility rate? I'll give you all a couple of seconds to guess. Some of you might have read the headlines. So these uh, data points I think are from 2022, but it was South Korea with a replacement rate of under below one, which is absolutely shocking and very, very strange. But South Korea has all the same issues as Japan, just maybe at an even worse rate, a lot of sexism, a lot of inequality between men and women. Um, more and more competition for good jobs, um, wages are not keeping track with economic growth, a lot of problems, you can see the result. Hong Kong, again, Singapore, Ukraine, that might be for many reasons. I mean, the uh, Ukraine is a, is a middle-income country, but corruption, crime, very high. There has been a war for the past, uh, or at least armed conflict since 2013-14. Uh, more or less steadily ongoing. 
recently erupted even more violently, so that could explain that. And you see Spain and Italy, which is very interesting, right? Um, a long time ago, people used to theorize that um, maybe the dropping fertility rate is related to cultural reasons, but you can see that these countries all have very, very different cultures, religious traditions, languages, uh, ethnic compositions. There doesn't really seem to be any cultural, ethnic, historical factor at work here. It really does seem to be linked to um, if you have growing economies, if you have higher income levels, uh, if you have especially inequality and instability at the same time, in all these countries inequality has been growing quite steadily, um, US as well, um, then you get fewer and fewer kids. So it seems to be linked primarily to money uh, and how economy structures are alive. Um, US and China are also below 2.1. Now what you also see, this is from um, one of the EU institutions, um, I'll include all the links at the end and below the uh, video, you can check them out. The proportion of people aged 65 and over at the moment in the EU and Japan are around 20-30% in most countries. Uh, in 30 years, it's going to be about 25-40% of the population. So the caretaking duties are going to massively grow and also um, the proportion of the working age population will shrink. And the same is going to be the situation in Thailand, Canada, China, South Korea. US is tricky. The US has massive migration. They're accepting a lot of people legally, illegally uh, from other countries. And of course, the government and Everyone knows very well about the illegal immigration, but it plays a very important role in keeping the U.S. economy going. Cheap labor force, untrained labor force, people you don't need to provide social security for. Uh, they're basically making use of half-slave labor. Not a very nice thing, but that's how the U.S. has been working for the past few hundred years. Um, some more data on other countries. The EU numbers are very, very low. So, you know, definitely it's not only Japan, the average is 1.5. Uh, if you look at the larger countries, Germany 1.7, France 1.8, which is, I think, the highest in the EU, uh, Poland 1.3. If you contrast these numbers with Africa, African countries, the numbers are very high, mostly, especially in sub Saharan Africa. If you look at uh, the countries north of the Sahara Desert, they are typically a little bit closer to middle-income countries. Some of them are actually middle-income countries. Their um, infrastructure, roads, housing, clean water, energy, and so on are a wee bit better developed, closer to what you would um, expect to find maybe in Central Asia or uh, some Latin American, poor Latin American, Central American countries. And um, the least developed countries have the highest numbers for many reasons, right? So you might think of the families simply needing more children to feed them, do the caretaking duties. If you, there is no social, um, social network system, no social security system, there's no pension, there are no elderly homes, there are no hospitals. If someone is ill, old, infirm, out of a job, family has to take care, you need more people, you need a network of people. Um, what might be the reason behind the fertility changes? As I said, there's no single reason probably, definitely not culture or religion. Um, the changing nature of family support, economic opportunity, optimism, or the lack of it. In most of the high-income countries, what we see is that despite enormous economic growth in the last 50-60 years, since the, the Nixon era and the Thatcher era, um, most of the wealth, most of the growth was captured by the top 5-10% of societies. So the rest, the, the other 90-95% are pretty much where they were 40-50 years ago in terms of quality of life. Now of course people under these circumstances are not very hopeful that it makes sense to have a large family. Nobody is sure whether they're going to be able to afford land, a house, whether they're going to have a job, why would they take on kids, right? 
growing uh, life quality that can also motivate some people if you have more fun if you can only focus on yourself without needing the support of family you can simply go that way um, being after a war usually has an optic effect on fertility rate in some countries this might e explain uh, some positive changes uh, having worse educational systems in some uh, cases we can see that uh, education especially sexual education biological education is very strongly linked with uh, fertility rates that but it's not necessarily a reliable predictor you can see that on heavily religious countries which typically want high birth rates for ideological reasons uh, once they get to higher income levels it doesn't matter anymore look at the US uh, Poland very religious countries US is almost a fundamentalist country in some ways the the role of religion is very determining in politics and ideology Poland is, is a very str a strongly religious country it's definitely a huge factor in everyday life and politics for a lot of people not everyone of course but a lot of people still but as long as you don't get good education of course in Poland in the US you get very good education uh, they have very uh, well working decent educational systems there's a lot of information about uh, sexual protection and so on okay, you see different numbers um, there's also an idea that uh, people switch child rearing models uh, this idea is uh, prominent in sociology once you get to higher income levels people tend to focus rather on quality instead of quantity rather than having six seven children and hoping that you know three or four of them survive reach adults who then do decently and can support you and each other you have one or two kids and you try to pool all your resources to give them the best education so they can have the most fun they can do sports they can travel and so on and so on and so on you try to max out the quality of the life of but of course for most of us for financial and energy and time constraint reasons uh, this is going to be one or two kids now how about the US the US is very interesting right the richest country the still maybe China is now a larger economy by some measures GDP PPP and so on but in many ways the US is still uh, the the most uh, the leading country in the world uh, in terms of wealth uh, you see that in very large parts that are colored red the population is declining um, and um, the blue areas are where you can see significant and the green areas where you can see significant positive change so people are migrating within the US and of course moving to the US but all this seems to be concentrated on the coast California Florida uh, Northeast and some large population and business centers um, that have traditionally been very important you can see like the big Texas centers of course Houston Dallas and so on um, interesting thing um, so very uneven um, we can take a closer look at the US by ethnicity this data is collected by the US authorities um, so white Americans seem to be in sharper decline than black Americans but even they are below replacement rate and Hispanics have the highest replacement rate now this is also very interesting we can't go into that for time constraint reasons I don't have the data on uh, my fingertips but there's also big differences in first generation Hispanic second generation third generation also has to do with education income uh, fascinatingly complicated topic but you can see that the uh, composition of the ethnic composition of the US is changing in important ways uh, France is also very interesting it's got an uh, overall really high replacement rate depending on which year you look at it the numbers vary slightly from year to year but as they classify this is the way they gather data native born so people who are at least second generation French their replacement rate is slightly lower whereas people who just migrated into the France of their first generation they just arrived from somewhere else that might be a former colony that might be some country in Europe that might be the US or wherever they're coming from their average is a good deal higher 2.6 um, so that might tell you also something about where people are coming from they're probably coming typically from lower income countries um, China right the other giant we peaked over the shoulders of the US China people have been saying is 
uh, having a similar situation to Europe, Japan, and to maybe like the wide population of the US, um, we see that um, there is a large number of um, middle-aged people, by far that's the largest, but the population of retired people, mature people, is growing very steadily. Um, of course, the life quality in China has gone up enormously, and their government has done a there's a lot of corruption, a lot of problems, but they have done a better job than some other places at uh, making sure that uh, there is some upward mobility, more and more people can afford relatively decent lives, and they're spending all that money uh, pouring into China, at least some of it on social networks, which should be done, of course, in other countries as well. Uh, but it's not done to the right degree. Anyway, you also see something very strange, right? The uh, male surplus and the female surplus. There is a story behind that, very complicated, I'm not going to go into that uh, for time reasons mainly. Um, but as you see also in China, the number of younger people is pretty low, especially under five. So that's going to hit back in the long run, of course. This cohort is going to get smaller, and when this cohort gets older, you're going to have a very strangely shaped population pyramid that's going to be very hard to um, finance, at least with the current models that we have. We might have to change how we think about work, living, distribution, equality, and so on. Definitely in a neoliberal order, it's impossible. Um, solutions, right? So some possibilities that have been discussed by politicians, international organizations, and uh, demography and economic experts are that we could just promote to have kids. Uh, Hungary, my home country, has a very interesting program where you can get a quite large loan to buy your family house if you sign a contract that you're going to have three kids by the age of 35. Uh, of course, this has a lot of issues. Um, it pushes a lot of people who don't have money into having kids, um, not necessarily people who have the right educational background and so on. There are some checks in the system to prevent this, but it's not working flawlessly. Uh, if you for some reason do not manage to have children, you might have to repay the loan, which might also be very difficult. Um, and also, of course, promoting having kids makes environmental problems worse as well. So it's very hard to, at the same time, uh, try and do something about climate change and popula shrinking populations. Um, migration is one solution that many countries are looking into. Germany is actively, uh, the UK and the US have, uh, Canada, Australia, these countries have large uh, immigration programs that are very much supported by the governments and there are large networks of institutions that facilitate the um, kind of inclusion uh, of people who just arrived to the country, you know, providing language classes and so on, but needs a lot of flexibility, uh, both on the side of the person, people moving to a country, they might have to give up a lot of their uh, values, beliefs, change them, fine-tune them, uh, on the part of the people accepting them, uh, there has to be a willingness to change on both sides and of course mainly on the side of the people who go to another country which already has an established system and that's what you should respect um, and of course you need very strong robust systems to support the incoming people I'm for migration in most cases but um, you know um, migration only works well if inclusion is properly supported institutionally there are enough social workers language teachers there is enough space for people's as children at schools there is enough uh, medical additional capacity and so on and so on and so on and the job market can uh, help people to join the workforce in a meaningful way they don't just get menial jobs low-paying horrible jobs uh, where their quality of life won't be good um, Technology can help with some jobs, um, can, you know, you might have a shrinking population, but some advanced countries hope that, well, AI can take over certain jobs. Um, in that case, ideally, humans could do more caretaker jobs, become teachers, nurses, uh, psychologists, and so on, uh, support others and fulfill roles that AI is not good at, incapable of doing at this stage, uh, more emotional and uh, creative empathy uh, requiring jobs that's one hope but technology hasn't delivered yet i mean we don't see substantial replacement of full complete job roles just skills 
which is a different story again. Um, we might end with a question. I'm a philosopher, obviously. The, the moral question comes up. Is it good to have more people in the world? What do you think about it? I'm very happy to read your comments, very happy to hear your ideas. Um, in a sense, we have enough food, but, um, you know, at the moment, and probably for a few billion more people, but um, doing that sustainably is going to be an imperative if you want to avoid uh, even worse climate catastrophes than the ones that are already on the horizon. Um, so mass, masses of people need to get used to and comfortable with the idea of uh, diet switches and consumption habit changes. I know it's very trendy at the moment to ridicule vegans uh, for all the wrong reasons, but it might have to become serious options and uh, you know, limitations on meat simply because of the amount of energy, resources and space that meat growing uses up might be necessary if the population keeps growing. Um, cultural changes might be required, you know, people might, uh, diet changes are uh, connected to many people's religions, traditions, values and so on, their identity. Um, industrial changes come with that, of course. Um, meat, fish industry are enormous, very influential, huge lobby behind them. And then there's just a question simply whether it's better to have more people. Obviously, in a way it is. Uh, if there are more people, there can be more joy, more happiness. The overall amount of well-being in the world can grow. Um, even if people live in low-income countries or middle-income countries, as long as they have uh, their basic needs met and they can have fulfilling jobs and uh, families, friends, creative activities, uh, most people can be happy. Um, so that's a good thing. Um, and also, in a certain sense, uh, we can have more talent, of course. Future people do matter for many, many reasons. Uh, but all this depends, of course, also on the distribution of birth, right? Where people are actually born in large numbers, what are their chances of happiness uh, at, uh, at a good level of well-being. At the moment, many children are born in countries with uh, lower quality of life, very spotty uh, educational systems, um, lacking health care, and we see still high child mortality rates, sadly, in many countries, uh, which is just terrible and tragic. There is no other word for it. Uh, the other thing that we see is that um, in many, many countries still there is a lot of child labor. The number of slaves in the world is around 60 million by all estimates. Um, there is a lot of trafficking, abuse, exploitation, both sexual and labor. Um, and there is also, of course, very dangerous religious fundamentalism even in some high income countries like the US or Saudi uh, Arabia and Qatar and other places. But also, of course, in other large countries. Like so. Indonesia, West Asian, African countries. Now, if these countries grow in population, it's not necessarily a very good thing in a moral term, in the sense that religious fundamentalism can be very dangerous. Usually, um, it leads to uh, large-scale conflict and uh, people prioritizing their uh, religious, their interpretation of their religion over legal systems, which makes coordination between countries and within countries much harder. And of course, like. Uh, can lead to wars and other issues as well. Um, at the same time, think about how cruel it is to say to someone that they cannot have kids. Like any of you who had children or who know people who have children know how much happiness and joy kids can bring to life. Uh, it's a fantastic thing to have children in many, many, many ways. And denying the right or saying to people don't have children, that's also just uh, seems to be one of probably the cruelest prohibitions that you can place on people, even if it's well-intentioned and necessary, it's a huge burden. Well, that's all that I wanted to discuss in this connection. I hope you enjoyed uh, the uh, video and you found it informative. Let me know what you think about it and uh, very happy to hear your questions. Check out the resources that I uh, uploaded under the video and um, keep thinking. Have a great day. Bye-bye.